thank you for taking the time uh, out of your busy day to join us in this session. My name is Alan Jones. I work at the University of Ottawa Professional Development Institute. I kind of oversee the cybersecurity and um, national security programs. We have the, having this introductory session, which I think is very interesting. Uh, and it's an exciting new collaboration between University of Ottawa Professional Development Institute and University New Haven, not to be confused with University of New Hampshire, UNH, University of New Haven, on national security studies. As many of you know, our PDI national security program has grown considerably uh, in the recent years. And a focus of that growth is seeking international collaboration with similar programs uh, in universities or organizations or just with experts. And to have these connections allows us to bring in expertise uh, with direct knowledge of parts of the world, which we may not otherwise have access to, and allows PDI and national security and all of us to tell the Canada story to a far broader audience and to facilitate access to courses and other programs and allow others to have access to our programs. Along the way, we have met some really great people to work with. And it's my pleasure today to introduce you to Dr. Jeffrey Treisman. Uh, who's become a good friend of PDI uh, and is an excellent colleague. He'll provide an overview of the U New Haven National Security Program and his initiatives. Uh, as background, uh, Dr. Treisman is an associate professor and chair of the National Security uh, Program at the University of New Haven. Prior to that, he was a research assistant at the Institute of National Security and Counterterrorism. He has served as a consultant to the Department of Defense's Africa Command, AFRICOM, and was a policy advisor for the Department of State in Iraq. Dr. Treisman currently sits on the editorial board for the journal Studies in Conflict uh, in Terrorism. His research interests uh, focus on military, international relations, asymmetric war and terrorism. We will, I will turn this presentation over to Dr. Treisman. Uh, I encourage you to post questions in the Q&A section, not the chat section, in the Q&A section. We may combine some of the questions if they're very similar, just in the interest of time when we get to the Q&A session, uh, and we will endeavor to answer your questions. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to Jeffrey. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Alan. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Jeff Treisman. Uh, I am the chair of the National Security Program at the University of New Haven. Uh, very excited to be here to talk about our partnership between the University of New Haven and the University of Ottawa's uh, PDI program. Uh, this is, just for reference, a, a broader, a small part of a broader initiative that we're trying to launch uh, in terms of partnerships and collaboration amongst those member nations of the Five Eyes intelligence community or security community uh, that has really existed since uh, the end of World War II. What we're going to do today is just talk briefly about this notion of national security or security studies, what it is, uh, and then we'll talk more specifically towards the end about the formal partnership that we've established between the University of New Haven and Ottawa. Um, so just real quick, uh, as the um, introduction has already been kind of done for myself, but uh, I am the chair prior to coming to the university. Uh, I was with the uh, uh, Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism, spoke, focused mostly on religious terrorism. Uh, before that was with the Department of Defense, working on counterinsurgency strategy on the African continent. Uh, and then finally, I was with, uh, before the Department of Defense of the Department of State, which is the United States diplomatic arm, I uh, was the advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is national security or security studies, and it's a very actually timely topic. Uh, I was just actually speaking recently with a colleague of mine at King's College uh, in London, and uh, she was uh, indicating that the, they actually, amongst their, their own department, had a debate about how do we define national security? How do we define security studies today? Uh, and it's actually changed dramatically, uh, not only over centuries, but decades and even the past couple of years, arguably. 
uh, really the very first national security or security studies program arguably started in the year 1919. And again, this idea or this concept of national security or security studies has existed for centuries, um, arguably dating back to the kind of the first study of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, but really, the modern incarnation of security and security studies is a subset of international relations, which in of itself is a subset of political science. The very first formal academic program in international security uh, formed in 1919 in the United Kingdom, shortly after the First World War. A lot of this was obviously due because of the theorists that existed in the world of political science didn't really have a very strong explanation for why uh, World War I uh, occurred or broke out. Uh, in fact, those debates continue to this day. Uh, but I think it's very telling that the national security or idea of national security and security studies really started with the end of World War I in the United Kingdom, formally as part of an international relations program. That's important, I think, to understand. Again, as I alluded to a moment ago, this idea of what is national security or security studies has changed dramatically, especially within the past couple of years, where it's not necessarily relegated or confined to the international domain. And it has a great deal of overlap with other features or aspects, specifically homeland security and kind of the domestic side of things, or even in terms of policing. And this is very common when we debate national security or security studies today. What does it actually mean and how does it relate to all these other aspects when we're very concerned about security, when we're concerned about implementing policy related to security? And the first question is, is typically, how does it relate to criminal justice and policing? And I always try to make clear is those of us here that are interested in national security and security studies, we're not too concerned with an individual speeding down the highway. That's not national security. We're not too concerned about petty theft, right? Robbery, that doesn't really concern us in national security. But we are concerned when, let's say, a couple of individuals decide, brothers, uh, decide to build a homemade bomb using pressure cookers and place them in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States during a marathon. That is a, a criminal justice element that overlaps significantly with national security and security studies. So there is certainly some overlap in terms of what we do in the realm of policing. There's, of course, overlap in homeland security. Here in the United States, we actually, again, and similar to what we're discussing about what is national security, we have the same discussions actually in Congress a couple of years ago. What is homeland security? In fact, Congress members task uh, the Congressional Research Service, which is uh, the CRS. It's kind of an, uh, if you're not familiar with it in the United States, it's a very independent, if you will, think tank associated with uh, Congress in the United States. And task them and ask them the question, what is actually Homeland Security? And they acknowledge, the CRS acknowledge, well, actually, it's quite difficult to define. And when you look in the United States at our Homeland Security, our Department of Homeland Security, it's very unwieldy. It's a large organization that encompasses so many different aspects that you wouldn't typically think of as being part of national security. For example, plant and animal inspection. That is technically part of Homeland Security, but that's not what we're interested in when we talk about security studies. We are interested in the TSA. Right? When individuals decide to board commercial airplanes, hijack them and fly them into commercial buildings in New York and Washington, D.C. on September 11th, that is of concern to us in security studies. We are interested and concerned about who's getting on to our airplanes, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world. Right? There's other aspects of homeland security that's increasingly becoming inherent part of national security studies. Uh, for example, protecting the coastal borders, the Coast Guard in the United States. That is of interest to those of us who study uh, security studies or uh, implement or draft policies related to national security. 
But national security has traditionally, as I alluded to a few moments ago, it's really been international in its orientation. Again, starting with 1919, when the first international relations program was launched in the United Kingdom after World War I. So national security and security studies has always been concerned about the international dynamic or element of security. Right, Two states, or what we formally call states, two countries going to war with one another. One of the easiest examples I always use for folks when you're trying to conceptualize or think of what is national security is just simply think about the Cold War. Right, The United States and the West and the Soviet Union potentially going to war with one another. Right, That has traditionally been a, 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 the typical example of what is national security. But as we see, there's a good deal of overlap between national security and homeland security, national security and criminal justice, and they all intertwined in some capacity. So as you can kind of see, as, as I said, my colleague at the King's College in London was debating what is national security it can become quite convoluted quite easily. And there's new areas of national security or elements of what constitutes or defines national security. Traditionally, it's always been the international dynamic, right? Conflict between two states, conflict between two countries going to war, worried about the national defense, arms control. Uh, all those aspects has been kind of have been a traditional form of national security, but we've increasingly see these other elements creeping into this definition economic security in particular. In fact, in the United States here, our national security strategy, the NSS for the past several presidential administrations, it's a bipartisan recognition as a matter of fact, is that economic security is national security. That's actually a direct quote out of the NSS, the national security strategy of the United States. It's a recognition of the importance of free trade, of economics, access to resources, access to maritime transportation, right? Freedom of navigation, if you're familiar with that term, right? This is a growing element of national security. I've written and been, some of my colleagues as well, have talked about the importance of GDP and growth and productivity in a country as being a very important element now of national security. A good friend and colleague of mine, Seth Jones, actually wrote a piece a couple of months ago, The Empty Bends Phenomenon. And he found that if the United States were to engage in global war with China, which I think is very likely in the near future, the United States would actually run out of armaments within roughly two weeks. That's shocking. And Seth had emphasized the fact that that therefore means we need strong productivity and economic growth to produce weapons and armaments today. So you can see quickly that relationship between international security and economic security. And increasingly, we're seeing human security as the important component of what is national security, the protection of human life, the quality of life as well. Right? How people are living, not just in Canada, or the United States or the West, but around the world. How does that affect security studies? How does that affect terrorism? Right. So human security and the protection of human life, including the environment, which I'll talk about in a few moments, is a yet another growing area of national security. So what is national security today is rapidly changing. Something that we haven't seen really, even in the Cold War, is very static, is focused on an international component. Again, two countries going to war, the United States and the West versus the Soviet Union. That has kind of changed or evaporated, if you will, over the past several decades. And so that means what we do in national security, what you do in your policymaking experience is pretty diverse. Right? We always think about on the far right there, again, military component of national security. That, to be clear, has always been important and it always will be important, right? Military power. Those of you who have perhaps studied international relations in the past or maybe as an undergraduate student many years ago, we, we understand and recognize the importance of power, military power, the, importances, uh, the importance of alliances, is an important part of military power. What other nations bring to the table? We've unfortunately seen the comments about NATO and contributions um, by President, former President Trump. 
uh, right, that undermines the power and security of NATO, uh, the credibility as an organization. Right. That's why it was so controversial. And that's why military has and always will be an important instrument, if you will, of national security. But when you think about careers of what everybody here might do or may want to do in the future, right, there's other aspects of national security that are arguably more prevalent. Diplomacy. Right. Very rarely do we ever go to war. We always think of national securities involving war, involving that far right there, military power. But very rarely are military instruments used. War, as I'll show in a few moments, is quite rare. We actually talk quite a bit. We talk to our allies, Canadians and Americans, NATO, the West, but we also talk to our adversaries as well. Very important to talk and have those lines of communication, especially, especially when we think about nuclear power in the modern era today. And diplomacy is quite broad, as I always tell my students uh, and family members, is when you travel abroad, right, when you travel abroad to, let's say, Europe or Latin America, Asia, or wherever you go, you are inherently representing your country. When you carry that passport, right, you're inherently representing that country. That's a form of diplomacy, what some scholars, Joseph Nye in particular, is called soft power, right, the ability to influence another state, to represent another state or country. So diplomacy is a very important instrument of national security that doesn't involve conflict, that doesn't involve war. And then, of course, there's economic instruments. As I said a few moments ago, economic security is now an important and integral component of national security, part of the America's national security strategy. And if you think about it, right, this is probably one of the most prevalent forms as well, or instruments. When the uh, Russian invasion occurred with respect to Ukraine, the Western community didn't necessarily, and NATO didn't necessarily go to war with Russia. We imposed economic sanctions, embargoes, right? Targeted individuals, their wealth, capital flows. Same thing with China, with respect to China. The United States and the West has imposed various sanctions and embargoes and quotas, et cetera, on, on China. We haven't leveraged military instruments. We're more frequently using economic instruments. And it applies across the board. It doesn't necessarily mean when we're talking about two states or two countries potentially going to war and instead we're using the economic power, right? It applies to non-state actors as well. Think about terrorism, counterterrorism finance today, right? all related to economic or this broad domain or bucket, if you will, of economic instruments of power. And of course, we would be remiss today if we were not to talk about modern computing, right? The cyber domain as well, right? This is growing in importance as I tell my students in terms of what is national security, what constitutes national security, part of the debate that we have in policy making circles, especially when we think about potential policy responses to cyber attacks. What is the most practical way to respond to, a, say, an Iranian malware attack or something that was just in the news two weeks ago with China, right? How do we respond? How do we ethically respond as well, right? Thinking about the laws of war, how does that apply to the cyber domain? And if you think about the, the current environment today, right? Autonomous drones, right? There are literally drones flying uh, over Ukraine now that have the independent decision whether or not to launch the munitions. As far as I am aware, that has not actually occurred, but it exists. As I always joke, right? The Skynet and Terminator, it exists today. We are now living in that world. But again, when we think about is national security just simply international or is it creeping into that domestic sphere, I think cyber is an excellent point to highlight, right? We know, for example, that uh, operatives working in St. Petersburg have hijacked local communities and banks and hospitals uh, and town centers in the United States, right? Thinking about really down to the local level how that cyber instrument is being leveraged as a tool for national security. So national security is extremely broad, and that means it's very or overly simplistic to think about the world today 
as either being at war, war or at peace. And I always say it's far more complicated than that. It's far more complicated, especially when you think about all the different instruments of national security. And you think about all the potential threats and challenges national security, especially today, right? Think about the potential conflict spectrum, as one scholar has called it, right? the range of potential threats that we could face. And for decades, right, we've always been focused on the far right there. The potential for nuclear war between the United States and the West and NATO and the Soviet Union. The potential for conventional war. We've always been concerned about those elements. And we should be, for obvious reasons. But as scholars have pointed out, this is Donald Snow in particular, has said we need to recognize these other challenges, these other threats, if you will. Uh, for Canadians and Americans in particular, we're very familiar with the war in Afghanistan that recently ended, right? Uh, especially the Canadians' and involvement in Afghanistan. It's an unconventional type of conflict, as they say, right? It's not engaging or engagement between two countries or states going to war with one another, but a country and a non-state actor, Taliban, Qaeda, ISIS, etc., Think about Afghanistan, we can certainly think of Iraq, Syria, Yemen, arguably what's happening today with Israel vis-a-vis -vis Hamas, right, in the Gaza Strip. Those unconventional conflicts, often inside, internal to a state or internal to a country, which is very difficult to resolve from a policy-making perspective, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And increasingly, we've seen national security move into the far left, these non-combat-oriented missions, right? The military instruments of national security are no longer relegated or simply limited to the far right of conventional or nuclear war, but instead involved in other areas, right? Think back to one of those first slides I just showed about human security encroaching into our definition of national security, right? When there's international... Uh, environmental disasters, hurricanes, or flooding around the world. The military is involved in some capacity pro providing humanitarian assistance, helping and assisting with the logistical network and delivery of humanitarian aid. Uh, forest fires here in the United States, flooding, if you remember Hurricane Katrina, roughly, I think it was 2005, right? Even COVID, I don't know about Canada, but here in the United States, locally in my community in, in New Haven, uh, our Air National Guard was actually helping and assisting uh, local officials in terms of administering the COVID test during the height of the pandemic. So it's changing, right? The challenges for future policymakers far different, or the types of threats are far different from that what we have prepared for in the past. We've always been prepared for conventional nuclear conflict. This is always an ongoing debate. But we do see these unconventional or non-combat oriented missions increasingly becoming part and parcel of national security. And so I think it's very important to have new minds into the realm of national security or policy making, to really have new minds thinking about these different challenges. What should we emphasize or where, where should we place the emphasis? I don't know. These are debates that we're having and there's no right or wrong answer. And that's what's very scary, right? When we think about national security. It's very scary when we think about, again, how national security is changing, both in the United States and Canada and around the world. These domestic challenges that we're facing. January 6th, the United States came very close to having its democracy overthrown here. Very close, right? That's a new challenge that has, and again, blurred that line, that Venn diagram of what constitutes national security. And I think it, again, highlights the fact that we need new ways of thinking about national security today to focus or address these new challenges that we see today internally. And as I'll say in a few moments, those internal challenges are arguably much more difficult to resolve and intractable than international challenges in many respects. And again, if you think about how the world works today, the threats and trends and conflict today, 
war is fairly rare right especially since world war ii that blue uh the light blue there color indicates uh interstate two countries going to war with one another that's pretty rare in the world today and i think this this always surprises many canadians and uh citizens or american citizens when we talk about that that war doesn't actually occur very often it's it's a rare phenomenon which, by the way, is why what's happening in Ukraine today is, is so very important in terms of national security. But instead, we see that yellow, or I guess more accurately, that mustard color, if you will. That's internal wars, or civil wars, if you will, right? Conflict within a country, a single country, between different groups. January 6th is a potential yellow, if you will, warning literally, for the United States. That's democracy potentially being overthrown. Civil wars are actually very difficult to end. I think a scholar has estimated that for every international conflict that ends, roughly 4.75% increase in the number or persistence in internal conflicts. In other words, they are very difficult to resolve. That's challenging. But again, if we think about conflict today, right? How do people die? If you remember the slide, the slide at the beginning, human security. If one of the important aspects of national security is the protection of human life, right? How are people dying today? Well, actually, the trend in casualties stemming from conflict has decreased precipitously since World War II, the, the last major, really, global conflict, if you will, right? Very few people die today as a result of war. That's important to recognize, right? How national security is changing today, right? Instead, there's other threats to national security or other threats, if you will, to human life. This was a huge study uh, conducted by actually medical doctors, not national security experts. That was published in The Lancet, the leading medical journal uh, in the world. Uh, it came out in the year 2017. It made international headlines. And these medical doctors tried to examine what is the leading cause of death in the world today. And they found, hands down, it's actually pollution. What's interesting is they include all sorts of pollution here, air, water, soil, et cetera, as the leading cause of death. And I encourage everybody, of course, to read this particular uh, article uh, that they published in The Lancet in 2017. Again, it made international headlines. And these medical doctors actually acknowledged the, uh, the number of deaths are actually probably higher than what they were able to establish. In other words, they acknowledged that it was very difficult in many cases to demonstrate that an individual's death was correlated or related to pollution. And again, thinking about human security, right? Smoking is the second leading cause of death in the world today. Disease, number three there. And obviously we were all very familiar or remember COVID and the global pandemic. So what is a national security threat is kind of changing in many respects. Or arguably, we're recognizing the emphasis should be potentially placed elsewhere. Malnutrition, road accidents, and then we get to war combined, the authors combined it with murder, criminal justice, going back to that Venn diagram slide of criminal justice there. Right, That's where we see that conventional military threat or casualties and deaths stemming from those elements down towards the bottom there. So what is a national security threat is dramatically changing. And the experts recognize this. In the year 2011, foreign policy, which I hope everybody here is familiar with, a leading journal on uh, national security and foreign policy, actually surveyed, I think it was roughly 67 of their experts and asked them, what is the leading threat to the United States today? And hands down, economic security. Right, thinking about how we define national security today, that economic component. And, you know, of course, all the other aspects of, as I said, conventional security are always going to be on the list terrorism, of war, uh, uh, nuclear weapons, that will always be on there. Now, as somebody had pointed out, well, this was a survey was done in 2011. Things have arguably changed because it was on the heels of the Great Recession. Very true. That is potentially true. 
Well, in 2019, the Council of Foreign Relations, another leading think tank, surveyed, I think it was roughly 250 experts, asked them, what do you believe is the global challenge, major global challenges today? Climate change was number one. The global economy and economics was the second major challenge in the world today. And again, you'll see these nuclear proliferation and conflict and terrorism that will always exist on the list. But again, what is the top or major global challenge in the world, right? How experts are defining it is changing. Interestingly enough, I found that the number 10 there, global health. 2019 was a major challenge that experts had identified. This was obviously before COVID and the global pandemic. Cyber governance was yet another element on there. And what constitutes a national security threat, again, is changing. I alluded at the very beginning that the environment is a growing concern, right, amongst security experts. And this is certainly true as we think about how the environment affects human life. Affects where people live in the world today, access to resources, to food resources, human security, the quality of life. This is increasingly becoming a part of national security. And even here in the United States, the Department of Defense has officially recognized climate change as a national security threat. Right? And if certainly we think about some of these elements of how environmental and climate change has affected national security. Uh, this photo is actually from 2019, OFAT Air Force Base, middle of the United States in Nebraska, if you're familiar with the, where that is, uh, experienced flooding, severe flooding, and OFAT Air Force Base had to shut down for roughly 36 hours. Those of us in the national security community held our collective breath because we were very concerned about the closure of this particular base. And many people were actually surprised. Why would you be concerned about the closure, closure of a base for 36 hours in the middle of the United States, in the middle of the nowhere? And the reason is because strategic command is located there. All right, our ability to respond, in other words, to a potential nuclear war attack was undermined or limited for those 36 hours. Now, to be fair, there's redundancies in place, obviously, but it still had an impact on our national security. The United States uh, uh, aircraft, stealth aircraft fleet, were 10% of them were almost wiped out in a hurricane, I believe it was in 2021, where almost 10% of America's stealth air freight aircraft were wiped out. Luckily, that didn't occur. Runways. The Air Force has actually identified runways as a and climate change as a national security threat. This was, I found, quite interesting. Uh, the Air Force has said that because of global warming, it's resulted in cracking in runways. That limits the number of aircraft that can take off. They're having to repair these runways. And I found quite interesting is that little pieces of the runway, little chips have the potential of obviously piercing tires or going being sucked into the engines. So all these very unique ways of climate change affecting national security in the United States. In California, on the West Coast, the uh, commander of the uh, Army National Guard for the state uh, made international no news because he declared no longer is the primary focus of the California National Guard to prepare for military conflict or war. Instead, it's to fight forest fires, right? What constitutes national security today is changing dramatically. And that leads to a very important question as you or all of us collectively is where should the emphasis lie? All right, how should we spend our scarce resources? This is the estimate from 2022 for the United States that defense budget is now roughly 800 billion US dollars, right? Is this an appropriate use of funds and resources? It's the equivalent to roughly in the next 11 or 12 countries combined. We can see Canada down there, number 15, right? Is this appropriate? use of our scarce resources and financial resources? Or should the emphasis be placed elsewhere? Should we be concerned with developing conventional weapons, nuclear weapons and armaments? Or should we focus on perhaps something else? Education, the environment, pollution, right? 
don't know. There's no right or wrong answer in national security. And that's why it's important to have new minds, new ways of thinking about national security and new global partnerships as well. And so to that end, the University of New Haven and University of Ottawa's PDI, we've established this partnership. And again, this is a small part of a larger initiative we're trying to launch with the Five Eyes Alliance and Western communities and allies, and, and specifically in terms of economic partnerships. So if you are a participant or enrolled in the PDI course, you can certainly come to University of New Haven's graduate program. You'll receive a 25% tuition reduction uh, to pursue your master's degree in national security. Uh, Canadian military, veterans, first responders, paramedics will receive a 50% tuition discount. Uh, this is all in an effort, again, to bring new ways of thinking into the world of national security to build these international partnerships between Western allies, specifically those within the Five Eyes Alliance, NATO, et cetera, around the world, because we need new ideas. We need new approaches and policies to face the challenges that we see emerging today, those, those challenges that experts have identified. Right. So certainly hope that you would consider the uh, partnership or taking advantage of this partnership that we've launched. We have three different master degree concentrations, national security, which is kind of a general security studies program, defensive cyber intelligence, what was formerly we used to call information protection and security. We have a lot of students who are always very curious about this particular concentration, this master's degree. How does it differ from a computer science oriented program? And I always say these, those students who are involved in defensive cyber intelligence really focus on intel collection, cybersecurity, but from a policy making perspective. So as I say, I affectionately call my colleagues in the computer science department the computer geeks, if you will. Uh, those students who are involved or studying defensive cyber intelligence have a basic familiarity with computer science and language, but not spending as much time as becoming in-depth or an expert in those areas, but more interested in the policy making experience or being able to speak with the computer scientists, understand what they're saying, and being able to translate it to a, uh, a principal or a senior administrator, right? Uh, being able to articulate and help define a policy response. So for example, I had used a few moments ago is let's say Iran uh, launches a cyber attack against Canada. How do we develop an appropriate policy response, especially a policy response that's in accordance with international law, which is quickly emerging in that area, or even ethically, which we don't have a good grasp on. Right, defensive cyber intelligence concentration is intended to in address those very issues. The third concentration that we have in our master's degree program is national security administration. Uh, this will be coming out this fall if you choose to enroll. Uh, this particular administration, uh, uh, the uh, concentration is aimed for those who are interested in more senior level positions in national security or security administrations. In other words, focus very much on the public administration side of things, as well as public policy. In fact, the National Security Administration concentration uh, is a dual concentration with the public administration department. And we also offer several graduate certificates as well, transnational cybersecurity, which is going further in depth in terms of the computer science and cybersecurity and network security uh, aspects of security studies. Uh, National Security Administration, which is just fewer courses involved with the public administration department. And of course, terrorism analysis, which we're launching this fall. Uh, actually, I'm personally very excited about this because most of my work has been in terms of non-state actors, uh, counterinsurgency and terrorism. Uh, and this includes not only the international aspect of terrorism, uh, but also the domestic aspect, which is increasingly uh, growing importance, and especially uh, in the United States and Canada and around the West. One of the great things, too, is as you're pursuing your master's degree, uh, any of these co three concentrations, you can simultaneously earn a graduate certificate. So you can actually leave the university and the University of uh, New Haven in Ottawa, coming out with not only uh, some experience with uh, coursework in, uh, through PDI, uh, not only earning your master's degree through University of New Haven, but also a graduate certificate as well. You can literally double dip your credits. 
So really what we're trying to do is prepare students for new ways of thinking about national security, critical thinking about national security. And of course, what is ethical, right? That's important to craft your future policies for uh, Canada in a manner that is in accordance with international law and is ethical. We also want our students to be able to think analytically. And yes, this does typically mean statistics, understanding big data, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning. That is important. We're recognizing the future aspects or dynamics of national security. And related to that is information protection security or cybersecurity, if you will. Uh, I am, full disclosure, I am definitely not a cyber guy myself, uh, <clears throat> but we always want our students to be prepared, again, for future threats or challenges in national security. So that's the essence of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, if you choose to enroll in our master's or degrees or our certificates, uh, there are five, generally five uh, required courses. The first one is an introduction to national security, what we call architecture and mission. Uh, it is not U.S. centric. We focus on all, typically most NATO countries in the West, as well as uh, those potential adversaries, understanding how they structure uh, their national security agencies and their apparatus, and what are the various missions, both in Canada, the United States, and Europe, uh, and of course, China and Russia. What are the missions of these different national security agencies? Uh, second, of course, we want our students to leave the program understanding inter the basics of international law as it relates to national security uh, and to craft future policy that's ethical as well. Uh, so, for example, we want our students who are developing, let's say, counterterrorism policy, right, to do so in accordance with international law. We no longer waterboard, if you will, right, as a simple example. We don't target civilians in warfare, right? We think about the uh, aspects of proportionality as well. The third course is our introduction to cybersecurity, what we call protection of information systems. Again, we want all of our students coming through the program to have a basic familiarity with cybersecurity. You don't have to have any prior experience or knowledge uh, or a prior degree in computer science. It's just a very introductory course. Uh, and it's usually a springboard for those individuals who might be interested in defense of cyber intelligence concentration. Fourth, there is policy and strategy. One of my personal favorite courses uh, to teach. Uh, how do we actually craft policy? All right. How do we respond to threats, both internationally and domestically? Right. Thinking about January 6th in the United States, so very close to having our democracy overthrown. How do we craft national security policy that addresses those domestic concerns or human security or the environment? And then final, final required course is our research methods course. Yes, statistics and big data. This is obviously a tool that is going to be used as we move forward in the future of computing and big data and analytics. So again, we want our students to have at least a basic familiarity with these, these issues. As I alluded to, we do have the defensive cyber intelligence concentration. If you choose to pursue that, uh, it simply entails allocating your electives for your graduate degree towards uh, any sort of computer science related course. Uh, we're very flexible in terms of what is a computer science or cyber course. Uh, many of our students actually take a large number of their courses and our uh, computer sciences department, our data analytics department as well. Um, so it's quite flexible. You're just allocating your electives elsewhere. The same thing applies to the National Security Administration concentration. Again, this is aimed at those individuals who are looking to move up uh, in terms of seniority or more advanced positions within their respective security agencies. Uh, it is jointly administered, if you will, with our public administration department. Uh, and again, very similar to defense uh, cyber intelligence, you're simply allocating your electives to, to classes within the public administration department. And again, we're quite flexible on those courses. If you are interested in cybersecurity, uh, we are recognized as one of the top actually uh, universities associated or uh, for by the National Security Agency. We're very closely associated with the NSA. 
Um, they're also very enthusiastic about our uh, outreach to other Five Eyes intelligence uh, partners, including Canada, obviously. Uh, had a conversation. We had uh, some CIA uh, officials visit our campus a few weeks ago. Uh, I told them our outreach and our partnership with our Canadian partners and Five Eyes intelligence partners. Uh, CIA officials were very enthusiastic about this idea, something I think even the policymakers themselves obviously recognize. And I always like the fact, the highlight, the fact that like many of you, our faculty have been there. We've done that. Uh, I've heard a little bit about my background, but I always like to highlight our faculty that have that firsthand experience. Not only does everybody have an advanced degree or a PhD, uh, but we have that experience in the policymaking realm. Uh, Andy Morgan, good friend of mine as well. Uh, he is actually still current technically with the CIA. We have a number of uh, CIA funded projects that we have. Uh, we're running in our National Security Laboratory, which is off campus and secure facility in New Haven. Um, Andy Morgan, by the way, is one of the countries in the United States here. We have one of our country's leading experts in deception. Um, he's briefed, I think, the past four presidents um, and has always taught my students, don't cheat because he will know. He will most certainly know. Uh, another uh, uh, faculty member, another good friend of mine as well uh, that I'd like to highlight is uh, Howard Stouffer, Dr. Stouffer, uh, many years as a U.S. diplomat. Um, most of his time was spent actually in uh, Russia and Soviet Union. Uh, he's got some amazing stories. If you ever take his course, uh, online course, uh, he's got some amazing stories. In fact, uh, he was on a private plane once with Gorbachev. Uh, so definitely uh, somebody to meet. He spent a number of years uh, with the United Nations in, uh, in terms of the counterterrorism committee as well. Uh, so phenomenal experts across the board. This is just a small sampling. Uh, so with that, I am going to actually pause. Uh, I believe, Alan, we are going to uh, take some questions. Um, so I will uh, end the presentation formally here. Uh, and Mike, please do let me know if you want me to turn off my video as well. But thank you very much and happy to answer any questions. Fantastic presentation, um, Jeffrey. And just, uh, you know, from my, my background, I started studying national security uh, over 45 years ago in the 1970s at university. And what's kept me engaged is I learned something new all the time. Every time I've engaged with someone, I, I learn something new or I look at something different. And your presentation was an excellent demonstration of why we want to collaborate because it's a dynamic environment. It's always changing. You're always trying to keep up what's happening around, around the world. Uh, and I found that fascinating. I'm sure most of our, all of our, our uh, participants did as well. Sonia, do we have any questions? Um, I'm looking at my, I think I've got, I'll look at one here. Uh, question, Jeffrey, are the slides available uh, to those who attended? Of course, uh, Alan and uh, Sonia, Mike, I, I can make them, you guys have them already. Um, yeah. Feel free to share. Totally fine with me, absolutely. Maybe I'll kick, thank you very much for that, because there's a lot of information that I've been scribbling notes as I'm looking and, uh, and I thought, geez, look at the slides. Uh, I'll ask you a couple of things that just occurred to me while you were talking. One, uh, your your conflict slide with the mustard color graph of, of civil wars and things. What are your views on what what is happening in Gaza? Is it a colonial war, a civil war, a bit of both, an interstate proxy war with Iran? How does something like Gaza fall into that slide? That, that, Alan, that would be a very deep conversation, I think, to have. Especially, you know, do, we, do we consider Gaza and the Palestinian territories yeah. a state, which is obviously the debate we're having right now? Yeah. Um, you know, was it uh, a form of international terrorism? Is it arguably a form of domestic terrorism? I think it's very difficult to identify or kind of pin that down. How do we define it? But I tell my students this all the time, and I actually had a conversation, uh, gave a presentation with some folks in Homeland Security a couple of years ago. And that question is very appropriate uh, in the sense that we need to define what is a war, what type of war, because then that determines the appropriate policy response. That then determines the type of resources that will be allocated and expended for that particular threat. Uh, defining it is very critical. And of course, as academics, defining that type of conflict, it's important how we study it, how we predict future conflicts like these potentially breaking out in other parts of the world. Um, so, you know, to kind of a scapegoat it, I'm not sure. And I don't think anybody really has a good idea on how we define it. 
Um, but it is very important, obviously, um, for clear policy reasons. It, I mean, this is one of the areas and one of the reasons we want to do uh, these collaborations in academic study, because Gaza is, is, is a highly complex issue with a long tail into history. But there are other brewing problems. Nagorno-Karabakh, what's happening in the Balkans, what's happening in West Africa. Uh, a lot of those things, they defy traditional old world definitions of, uh, of just interstate warfare or a colonial war. It's something else. Uh, borders are becoming a little more permeable. And with migration, which of course is affected by climate change, we're going to have a lot of people living in other people's neighborhoods. Uh, and it's complex. The other thing, which is something for us to look at, the other thing I'll ask you is that is the actual definition of war, uh, which is changing. We have traditional guns and bombs war, but we now have virtual battle spaces. And there has been, uh, uh, you know, work like in, done in Tallinn and others on, on international law about warfare in, in cyberspace and what it means. Have you worked on that? What are your comments on that? No, I, I have not, uh, you know, in terms of the definitions of what, you know, how do we define or constitute cyber attacks in terms of warfare? It's something that I admittedly, I am not an expert on. Thankfully, we do have faculty, there's other folks in Five Eyes Community, University of Ottawa, PDI, and around uh, and NATO that are experts on these. They're addressing these very topics. I have a number of colleagues that are, are kind of studying these very issues and how do we define it? And I think it's challenging. I think this is something that we see policymakers publicly grappling with uh, themselves is how do we respond to the United States and Canada? How do we respond to a, a cyber attack? What's How does it fit with our definitions of, of international law? I don't think we really we see our policymakers or even our academics having kind of a universal or agreed upon definition. I don't think we will at any time soon, but uh, I personally find it very fascinating. And hopefully, again, new minds and ways of thinking will help uh, help us solve these difficult, challenging uh, policy issues. Yeah, I have another question for you. The master is the master's degree program available to do part time or is it only available as a full time program? Uh, both, either, or uh, you're more than welcome to uh, pursue the master's degree part-time. I would say our master's degree is bifurcated between students that are straight out of undergrad, early 20s, going straight to their master's program. That's one half. The other half of our program uh, is actually uh, current policymakers working in the government, working in their private security uh, agencies or institutions, whatever they may be, uh, and going to school part-time. Uh, the degree can be taken online synchronous, meaning an interaction similar to this with a faculty member. Uh, it can be done asynchronous. Uh, or if you want to study abroad in the United States, as I always joke, uh, you're more than welcome to come to uh, Connecticut uh, and take courses in person, mix it up in any way you would like. Um, I, I think a lot of our students, though, those who are current professionals, uh, do enjoy the synchronous and asynchronous formats, online formats. And it's interesting it is a lot of students do enjoy the asynchronous format and pre-recorded lectures. I've had a lot of folks down at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., uh, or around the world. We had a number of Marines, U.S. Marines, uh, actually quite a few of them in Afghanistan for a brief period of time, taking remote courses uh, through their benefits through the United States government. Uh, but parents, students uh, that are adult learners, uh, they can put their kids to bed, you know, come home from work and then take the course on their own. So uh, the, the short answer is all the above, online, in-person, part-time, full-time. Question, how different are the impacts on national and international security linked to the current Ukraine conflict compared to during the Cold War? That's a big one. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, well, Alan, I don't know about you, but my immediate reaction would be uh, think about the debate that we're having right now uh, with respect to NATO uh, yeah. rock remarks and harmful remarks that the, the former President Trump made about uh, the contributions, independent members of NATO and their contributions um, in terms of defense spending. Um, I think it's the impact is very clear today in the conflict today. It's it's really serving on one hand to undermine, especially when you have these provocative remarks by American politicians uh, that just undermine the credibility of NATO and the uh, collective alliance. But on the other hand, I think one of the obvious impacts that, uh, Alan, that you might agree, uh, is that we've seen a strengthening of NATO, an enlargement of NATO. Yeah. 
So you've had these kind of two tensions, but I'd say on balance, especially as you compare it to the Cold War, we're seeing a a strengthening of the uh, Western alliance and specifically NATO and the enlargement of it, um, which arguably is beneficial. I I think it helps solidify what we're trying to do actually on this very webinar here. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard. It's hard to be an isolationist country in a globally connected world. You can't I, I will talk about it. let me interject there Alan yeah. I, I'm very frustrated with uh, <laughs> that's an important subject a lot of American politicians are making these provocative you know offhand remarks about oh you're a globalist or we shouldn't be involved in these global conflicts but I think when these politicians especially in the United States make those remarks it really demonstrates a lack of understanding of the history of the world and the interconnectivity yeah. that we see today so I'm glad you actually mentioned that are we seeing a merging of national security and emergency management? That's a great question. How do you draw a line between the two? Are they separable? Uh, I would say they're not separable. Uh, but your comments, Jeffrey? Oh, I would fully agree. In fact, I would say, uh, uh, yeah, I, I would think there's a growing merger between those two fields. It's something we've recognized. Uh, our undergraduate program, we have a, a degree in Homeland Security, is one of the fastest growing programs that we have. And it is in within our national security department. I think there's a recognition, especially as uh, human beings are able to move across the globe, either by choice or forced migration as well. Uh, This uh, blending of human beings across societies we're facing in the United States, obviously a migrant crisis, uh, as you've everybody's seen in the news, what that means in terms of terrorism, or even in terms of international relations. Like, what does it mean to be a citizen of a country? Um, the protection of a homeland, homeland security, homeland defense, and coastal defense. And so I think it's all part in and of itself the same. Yeah. yeah and, it's, and it's a challenge to politicians because the average citizen, whether their home is destroyed by a bomb or their home is destroyed by a wildfire or flood, it's the outcome is pretty much the same for them. And they're expecting to be helped uh, and protected by the federal government. And it's a whole of government approach, which is going to draw in the military, as we see in Canada, the U.S. and others in dealing with disasters uh, and increasingly internationally with humanitarian aid. I think that is a really great question uh, for the future. Uh, we're just about running the times. I'll, I, I'll ask her, I'll mention a little bit about the cybersecurity um, file because we have a program at PDI called Coding for Veterans where we train Canadian military veterans uh, 500 in the last four years uh, to go to work in cybersecurity jobs. It is a very technical training program, uh, not a graduate level program. And to be able to have access to your program, it expands our work. We also launched Coding for Veterans in the United States, uh, January 1st, with University of Southern California Marshall School. We actually had a float in the Rose Bowl Parade uh, which was a phenomenal experience to go through. So we have uh, coast to coast. We've got we've got the co- cyber covered with the USC on the West Coast and U New Haven on the East Coast. Uh, this is starting to come together. All this work is starting to come together. And I think there's more conversations to be had about the cyber file and how we can move people through that curriculum in, in continuing education. I'll just, well, you know, oh, more questions have popped up. A couple more. Uh, Okay, here's another uh, topic close to our heart is how do you see national security protecting itself from increasing disinformation campaigns that are undermining it? And of course, we have an information integrity lab at PDI looking at disinformation, but your comments, Jeffrey? Uh, I actually uh, was just in Germany uh, giving a talk with some NATO officials. Uh, it's technically at the Marshall Center in Southern Germany. Uh, their uh, program on terrorism, they bring in roughly a hundred uh, officers from around the world, military officers to Germany to talk about terrorism. Uh, I actually went there that was invited to speak to talk about uh, misinformation, disinformation, uh, and its impact on terrorism, domestic security, homeland security, and national security writ large. Uh, I see this as a growing field. It's an excellent question. I think this is a growing area of concern, uh, especially as we move into these large elections. Uh, I'm sure some folks saw the news recently about artificial intelligence uh, replicating um, President Biden's uh, voice and how that can influence democracy. So even talking about the more nitty gritty of political science and democracy and election management, uh, I think it's incredibly important. And I think this is going to be a growing field. Uh, I had mentioned a moment ago, we're launching our terrorism analysis 
uh, graduate certificate. And part of that certificate will actually be a course specifically dedicated to this topic. So it's an excellent question. I think that brings us right to the top of the hour. Uh, I just want to thank you so much again for so many times over the last couple of years for your help and your, for your support for this great presentation where we talk, uh, touched on so many topics that we could talk for hours about each one of them. But to do that, take our courses, sign up, uh, get involved, and we will talk uh, because we like talking about it and there's so much to do. I just want to do a quick shout out to Sonia who helped put this together and our, and our tech Mike who's done an outstanding job. And a thank you to all, everyone who's participated, uh, spent their lunch hour or part of their day uh, talking to us. We hope to see you again. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care. Ciao. Bye.